Russell Simmons' Deaf Comedy Jam, a hit comedy series on HBO for nine seasons, wasn't just a successful franchise, it was a cultural phenomenon. But what was life like after performing on Deaf Comedy Jam? We take a look with a brand new series, Life After Death. Frank Holden here, another episode of Life After Death. This episode, we have comedian extraordinaire, actor, Stan, he did the whole thing, the game. he did the whole tour and everything else with Def Comedy Jam. He's another brilliant guy who was in the first season of Def Comedy Jam when they came on, Mr. Ricky Harris. Ricky, what how are you doing, man? What up with it, Frank? First question I have to ask you, in your recollection, what was black comedy like overall before Def Comedy Jam? Um, it was bleak. It was really bleak. You know, uh, a lot of stand-up co comedians, uh, unless you had a big name, you know, like uh, Robert Townsend, Eddie Murphy, Sinbad, um, you know, those guys could work around the country and work in these comedy clubs, but young guys like myself, you know, I was, back then, I was, you know, maybe 17, 18 years old. Uh, they wasn't allowing us to, to be in those clubs like that, you know, so, the, 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 the black comedy scene really started popping with one comedy club in particular. Uh, it was a club on Crenshaw and 43rd. It was called the Comedy Act Theater. It was hosted by the late, great uh, Robin Harris, rest in peace. Um, he was the host and the, I wanna say, the air back then was just, it was magical because every artist who was of importance or trying to be important, important used to come to that comedy club. You know, that was like a, you know, a hangout spot, you know, just to come and see uh, Robin. And then you had guys like Robert Towns and Sinbad and, and, you know, Eddie Murphy eventually and all these big time comedians, you know, your George Wallace's, you know, your Steve Harvey's, all, all these guys would come there eventually and perform. So all the black entertainers used to come there. Mm -hmm. So it was just magic, man. It was, mm -hmm. it, it was really magic back then for the, 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 the black scene, you know what I'm saying? We called it the Chitlin scene. What were you doing at the time? Working mm -hmm. at the comedy club because by then, probably like my third month of attending that club, because I used to just go there first. My third month, Robin Harris came up to me. He said, man, are you really wanting to be serious about comedy? You know, because everybody think they're a comedian. Like, we don't do shit. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, we don't really study or nothing like that. So that's how I was. I didn't know shit. So. Robin took me under his wings, and by then, like I said, I was studying under him. I was learning the, the, the craft, and he appointed me as a DJ, because I, I used to DJ, and he said, uh, I don't want you scratching shit, just play the shit. When I walk, because we started all of that shit. We started the, the you know, because back then, the comedians used to come on stage, it would be a dude with a piano. Mm -hmm. And he'd play the comedian on, and he'd play the comedian off. So, you know, it was Robin's idea. I can't even take credit for it. He said, man, you, you know, you, for every comedian, you play them on, you play them off. You know, you can scratch them when they walking on or whatever. So I started doing that. You know what I'm saying? And then for him, it was always the same music. It was the blues. So, you know, I would, I would, I would scratch in the blues, you know, uh, either down home blues or something like that. I mean, we had all kind of different routines we ended up doing, but at first it was just scratch the record on, let the comedian walk on stage. When they finished their routine, scratch them off. And then, the, and then the next to me. So I started off doing that. And from there, Michael Williams, who was the, the, the head promoter, the, the main guy, the, you know, the heartbeat behind the whole Comedy Act Theater, he said, hey man, you know, I'm gonna start giving you more time, mm -hmm. you know? So uh, the first thing they did was, uh, <laughs> that, that nigga Robert put me on that, you know, one thing you don't wanna do when you a, a new comedian is follow that bad motherfucker. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So he would always put me after whoever was the baddest motherfucker that night. 
You next, Rick. <laughs> I'll be like, God damn, man. I can't follow fucking him or, you know, I, what am I say after him? Hey, do your shit. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, he, he would, you know, that, that was my part of my training. He would put me on after everybody. Robert Townsend, Eddie. I mean, one time he put me on after Eddie. Now, this is during Eddie's height. You know what I'm saying? He's preparing for his second special, which was Raw, I think it was, because mm -hmm. his first one was Delirious. By then, he, you know, he'll walk in a comedy club and shut it down. And, <laughs> you know, any club, white, black. When he walked in there, it was over. It was done. So, you know, this particular night, I remember he walked in. First, Charlie walked in. Everybody thought Charlie was Eddie. Everybody, oh, shit, this is Eddie Murphy. They was like, oh, that's Eddie Murphy's sent to look alike in here. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Start fucking with him. But uh, Charlie, you know, he, he went on stage, did something. And then Keenan Wayans went on stage. And then, no, no, Damon Wayans went on stage, blew the shit up. Then after him, Keenan came on, blew the shit up. And then Keenan went, I brought a, I brought a surprise for you all. Eddie Murphy. That's all he said. That nigga walked on stage, was on stage for about a good, I said about an hour and 45 minutes. Right. Rocking that motherfucker. And, and back then the Comedy Act Theater was extremely hard to rock. Like, like you know, you, you had professionals. You had doctors, lawyers, and then you had all these celebrities. So you know, you know, this Hollywood, motherfuckers would be like, oh, you, you ain't funny. You really had to fucking work. So, you know, he 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 brings Eddie on, Eddie gets on stage, rips it, da, 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 he, you know what I'm saying? Robin go up after him, you know, because Robin was the host. He go up, rip that motherfucker another 15, 20 minutes. Then he went, all right, ladies and gentlemen. Ricky Harris. <laughs> Look, motherfuckers was still clapping for Eddie. When they man, Eddie, man, he was hilarious, man. Eddie was hilarious, man. So I'm up on stage doing my little shit, you know, thinking I'm doing some shit. And, uh, you know, I, I saw it wasn't working. You know, I recognized that early in my career. When the shit ain't working, good night. So I, I did my good night shit. Good night. I love y'all. Bye. Went off stage, I was mad at the motherfucker. I said, man, damn. And Robin said, see, you already had your mind fucked up by telling yourself that you couldn't perform after Eddie Murphy. When you got material, you stick to what you do, let him do what he do, and I said, and you find it. So I learned that night, you know, how to, to kind of like, you know, just, Get in where I fit in. So you hear a you hear a, a, a comedy show is coming in town. It's called Def Comedy Jam. Yeah. How did you get on? And how what was the process like? Um. Well, I I knew all about the Def Comedy Jam because. So you knew about it before. Yes. Yeah. Yes, because all all the players they would come to the Comedy Act Theater. Mm -hmm. They would come there. That's where the whole basis of Def Comedy Jam started was at the Comedy Act Theater. And I remember seeing Russell, because like I said, every celebrity, when they came to town, they came to the Comedy Act Theater, mm -hmm. including Russell, including Run DMC, Heavy D, Big Daddy Kane. I mean, you know, all the, you know, the, the guys who were, you know what I'm saying, to me still are, you know, big guys in hip hop. Mm -hmm. They would come to, you know, to, to, to see Robin Harris, who was this little black, right. you know, dude, because his style was so different. His style was straight from the streets. Right, but they see, they, but you hear about the show. I hear, I hear about the show, all the producers and stuff hanging out the Comedy Act Theater because the original host was Robin Harris. I don't know if everybody know that, but he was. You know, thank God we did have Martin. You know, Martin used to come to the Comedy Act Theater. He was partners, we was all partners, you know what I'm saying? We all hung out at that club. And, um, you know, Robin passed, they gave the baton to, to uh, Martin. And Michael Williams, like I said, who was the promoter, he wanted, he wanted it to be called Michael Williams. Def Jam, Def Con. And Russell was like, oh, fuck that. This is my company, this is, you know what I'm saying? This is what, and then they did it, but they didn't choose me. 
They didn't choose me, I think, because the night they had the the, the tryout or whatever they call it, I was out of town. See, this is amazing because you were one of the first episodes that aired. I'm the, look, bro. The very first episode, bro, first bro, person. The first person, the first episode, and the last person they chose was me. The, the reason why I got that show was because another comedian friend, AJ Sanders, shout out to you. Um, she was an actress and she's a comedian. Uh, she was on, at the time, uh, the, the Cosby spinoff show with Lisa Bonet. Mm -hmm. She was on that show. And uh, she called me, she said, my friend, my friend uh, Bob Sumner, you know, he looking for comedians. Did, you didn't ever give him no videotape? And you know, back then, you know, I'm still basically one foot in the comedy club and the other foot in the streets. Mm -hmm. So I, I was not gonna, I was not gonna, you know, have no videotape or no shit like that. So me and the homies, we went to a little spot and I just recorded my shit, me doing it in front of them. I sent it to him. They called and said, oh man, your, your tape never got here, man. So they had a couple people from the club, the, the comedy act theater said, hey man, you know, out of the young motherfuckers, Rick is definitely one of the, you know, one of the motherfuckers y'all should be fucking with. So uh, they, they, they sent me a ticket and, and all of that shit. And, and I, end, I ended up doing it, but I was the, the last person they chose and then the first person they sent out there, and I re I'll never forget, I, I, I walk out there and the fucking, they had a, I had never used a, a fucking mic, a cordless mic, never in my routine because I had developed so much shit using that fucking wire, using the microphone. So I was like, I walk out with the, with the cordless mic, I'm like, what the fuck? And then it started tripping. In the middle of my routine in front of New York, and this is when New York, if you said you was from LA, they would boo your ass. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm like, I'm out there doing my shit and the mic just cut off in the middle of my routine. So I said, you know what? I said, fuck it. I just dropped the microphone, I walked off stage, they was booing me. Stan Latham said, oh, fuck that. No, 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 your shit is, no, you're, you're good, you're good. We can, we can edit this shit, trust me. I said, nah, man, I'm not gonna go back out there and fucking repeat the same shit. I'm not a comedian that like to fucking repeat shit. And uh, so I, they sent me back out there. I did it. I ended up getting a standing ovation. And uh, I dropped the, dropped the microphone again and I just walked off stage. But that's basically how that shit started, bro. You know what I mean? Okay, let's fast forward. Now Def Jam uh, airs. We popping. You're hot now. Yeah. Everything. Hey, the next day, that shit was number one across the board in every market. In mm. every market. In every fucking market, we was number one. How'd your life change? For me, you know what I'm saying? As a young guy, you know what I mean? A young newlywed and a young daughter. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't even describe it. You know what I mean? It's und undescribable. You know, when People are offering you, you know, ridiculous amounts of money that you think is ridiculous, but you know, what I'm saying, come to find out, you know, what I'm saying <laughs> that is just, you know, really the norm. But you know, it was it was incredible. It was an incredible feeling, you know. what I'm saying for all of us, you know, what I'm saying the Def Comedy Jam was like a brotherhood, bro. You know, what I'm saying you you got to understand it probably was no comedians over thirty. You know, what I'm saying we was all young, young and just you know out there just would do anything, say anything, you know, just to make those people laugh. And, you know what I mean? People don't understand, man, laughter is the key to everything, everything. If we don't want war, all this shit, man, it's laughter. That's why comedy is fucking spreading across the fucking globe now, bro. Mm -hmm. It's every fucking way, right. everywhere. You can go to Lebanon, Beirut, you know what I'm saying? Afghanistan, they doing stand-up comedy and they speak English. You know what I'm saying? So once we as a society and people learn to laugh at ourselves, you know what I'm saying? How ridiculous some of the shit that we do and say, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's all about comedy. So that's what Def Comedy Jam did. It brought out a lot of haters. 
A lot of celebrities was hating. Oh, those, those, yo, it used to hurt me to the core to hear another, another black man say that we was jigaboos or, you know what I'm saying? Or that we was selling out or something like that. And one thing my, my pops, he was alive. He said, man, ain't no such thing. He said, them motherfuckers is mad. And my father was a, was a Baptist preacher, pastor. He said, man, them motherfuckers mad because you guys are making money. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Advertisers want to mess with you. The producers are going to want to mess with you. They're going to want you in their movies. The, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the casting people are going to want to sit and talk. You know what I'm saying? So we pushed all of that. We pushed the culture. You know what I'm saying? Def Comedy Jam made motherfuckers look at themselves and laugh. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of us, you know, thank God we made money and we were able to have families and, you know, travel the United States of America. You know, I think we toured for three years. Looking back on it, Def Comedy Jam changed your career. You did a lot of things, you did music things that people don't know about with Snoop and everything else. But looking back on it, knowing what you know now, what would you have done differently if you could go and Ricky Harris that today's day can go could basically I'm gonna keep it 100 I don't give a fuck what nobody say or nothing I wish I would have got more fucking money I wish I would have paid more attention to them contracts and shit you know what I'm saying like you know when you don't have no money and a motherfucker say hey man we're gonna give you thirty thousand dollars you ain't giving a fuck about what nothing else another thirty thousand dollars oh shit or you know whatever the ridiculous amount they was giving us back then but i wish i would have paid more attention to that to the details of like you know like when back then it was vhs <laughs> the motherfuckers put vhs's out on us and then they turned that and put dvds out on us you know what i'm saying and we never got compensated for that shit. and then it was like some stupid shit to me because we had a class action suit and then you know we won and then you know when, when when a check get trickled down to everybody, you get like, you know, two hundred dollars. You like what? We sold we sold ten million motherfucking DVDs, and you're gonna tell me you're gonna give me a hundred dollars? Now that's some stupid shit. Other than that, man, I wouldn't change nothing. You know what I mean? I had a great run with Def Comedy Jam. I love all the people that was associated with it. You know, it introduced me to a lot of my friends that are my friends today. You know, all the stand-up comedians that I, you know, we like a fraternity, man, you know what I'm saying? When one of us is struggling, we all struggling. That's some real shit that everybody don't understand. We lost a lot of comedians, rest in peace. Uh, you know, all the ones that we lost that's from the fucking show. They died, man. Fucking comedian. You know, when a comedian died, that's one of the saddest times on the earth because we lost a person who's going, you know what I'm saying? Right. Say the shit that... You know, you might be scared to say or do the shit that we might, you know, not do. You know what I'm saying? You're like, ah, oh, look at that clown. But you never know how that clown is really feeling. Ricky, thank you for taking out the time. This is another episode, Life After another Death. Another episode, Ricky Life Harris. After Death, you bitches. <laughs> right. <laughs>